The Unshackled Waves, episode 86. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. This is a special review show being brought to you from New Zealand. Uh, those who are watching the show will notice I'm in a new location. I am in New Zealand to cover the final two weeks of that nation's general election. I'll be bringing you interviews with activists and candidates as well as on the ground reports. Now my schedule for the past week has been quite hectic, so apologies for the latest podcast uh, not being uh, released in a timely manner. Uh, there's a lot of election news to, to digest, so my co-host for uh, this New Zealand version of the review show is Mark John Price of Right Minds New Zealand, and he joined me earlier in a different location. But first I will tell you what is happening in New Zealand right now. The gloss appears to have worn off new Labour leader Jacinta Ardern. Uh, Jacinta mania, as it, as it has been called, has died down and now so proper scrutiny is being applied to her policies. So now uh, Tax Centre has emerged. So far she's promised a water tax, a regional fuel tax, reversing income tax cuts and also flirted with an inheritance tax, capital gains tax and a land tax. Uh, she has also pledged to conduct a tax working group after the election which will explore further tax options. While Jacinta is promising taxes, she is also promising death. She has pledged to her support for euthanasia when it comes up for a vote in the new parliament and also said she wants to remove abortion from the Crimes Act and she will most likely propose similar abortion laws than what's in place in Victoria and Tasmania. Uh, thankfully, there has been considerable backlash to her announcements. National Party Prime Minister Bill English opposes more death and more taxes, thankfully. Uh, he's probably considered the most conservative uh, Prime Minister New Zealand has had in recent times. However, he is widely seen as lacking in charisma and uh, also lacking the communication skills of his predecessor, John Key. He is promising further strong fiscal and economic management, along with tax cuts and more spending on health. But is that a strong enough agenda to energise the electorate? That is the question. A series of television debates have occurred between Bill English and Jacinta Ardern. They have been quite fiery, with Bill English taking Jacinta Ardern to task for the vagueness of her policy commitments, uh, as well as her general motherhood statements. Uh, Bill English was eager to promote himself as offering real solutions, but he struggled in areas of policy where National have failed over the past nine years. The polls have been quite unpredictable in this campaign. Labor has had surged ahead uh, once Jacinta Ardern took over, but then a poll more recently put the Nationals back in front by 10 points. The last poll had Labor back ahead by four points. It is an election which will go down to the wire if you aggregate all the polls, so it's going to be a very crucial next week. The minor parties matter in New Zealand due to there being mixed member proportional representation. Uh, minor parties must obtain 5% of the vote to or win an electorate to gain seats in Parliament. Uh, New Zealand First and the Greens are the only parties that have a realistic chance of gaining that 5%. Uh, the polls have been just as volatile with regard to their share of the vote. The Greens will always support a Labour government, while Winston Peters, the leader of New Zealand First, is keeping his options open. For those who don't know, New Zealand has dedicated seats in Parliament for people of Maori descent and they have been in existence since 1867 and they're elected by people who are from Maori descent themselves. Of course, having seats in Parliament reserved for a certain race is the definition of racism and there is now a movement to abolish them as they should have no place in a society which is based on equality. Uh, New Zealand First is the only party which is committed to abolishing them. Uh, housing affordability is also a big issue in this campaign, and for good reason. People in Australia often complain about house prices in Sydney and Melbourne, but in Auckland the average house price is $1 million. Of course, uh, this is probably the area of policy where the Nationals Party biggest fa failing is, and is what Labor is uh, whacking them with uh, over, the, over the course of the campaign. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's not often that we have the the guest or my co-host uh, in the uh, 
with me right next to me so this is quite a different type of podcast so hope you uh, thank you for being in person here ah uh, well no you called <laughs> okay so let's uh, talk about probably what is the or the the biggest or what they'd say x factor in this campaign which is Jacinta Ardern now mm. New Zealand is supposedly uh, in the midst of Jacinta mania it's been reported in Australia that New Zealand is just uh, captivated by her is 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 that your impression as well no it's complete bullshit it's overhyped um what actually happened was we had a, a change of leadership and what we've been getting is just post after post after post about her love life her, her lifestyle um what she's been up to it it feels like the e-channel it's um it's overhyped and it's done by the media it's people day to day just don't care and it's probably also because in Australia we've got the, you know, the active feminist sisterhood of like, you know, whoa, you know, this young woman's risen in New Zealand, what an inspiring story. And unfortunately that's uh, an opinion that's been coming here to New Zealand as well. Um, we've been seeing feminism kind of grow in New Zealand a little bit. Not as bad as Australia, I mean, we still wipe our feet when we leave Australia, but uh, um, no, it's, it's, feminism is, um, yeah, it's, bit, it's getting worse. Oh, well, I'm glad that there's uh, finally been some scrutiny of um, Jacinda's policy and uh, she's been given the nickname now by, I think, the, the young nationals, uh, Taxinta, because <laughs> she seems to be proposing a, a tax on everything. Are you able to give us a rundown of the taxes she's proposed? Yeah, she's introduced quite a few new taxes and uh, starting off with the capital gains tax. So uh, she's wanting to tax um, for, she's wanting to punish people who want to sell property. Um, whether that is residential or apartments. She's explicitly said recently that she doesn't want to tax uh, working families, but um, what about people who are just entering the market, like small business owners or entrepreneurs? Or you know, People seem to forget that capital does not mean residential housing exclusively. It, it, there's a whole lot of um, different property that comes under that. Um, like, there's also a talk about a water tax. Um, there's... The argument from the left is that, oh, we've got nice pristine aquifers underneath our land and um, these nasty bottle companies have been bottling our water and shipping it overseas and, okay, yeah, they might have some point on that. Um, and I can understand why the left uh, empathises with the um, the people who live in the areas. They're, they're getting affected by um, the abuse of the waterways um, where they're not able to... Uh, like drink properly, the rivers, like a lot of our New Zealand rivers are polluted. Um, 10 years ago, I remember it was about 25%, I think it's higher than that now, um, just from human waste and commercial waste. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's the government trying to get involved in industry that, well, governments shouldn't get involved in industries. Um, there's an inheritance tax. So for some reason, they think that um, uh, you, don't, you don't deserve um, the money that comes from your family. If your parents have made the conscious effort to save up money to give to you, um, you don't deserve that money. You should be taxed as an income, like PAYE, pay as you earn tax. Um, if someone dies in your family, then and you get taxed because you're not allowed, you have no right to someone else's money, even though they may have worked all their life for you. So um, it's controversial, but there's no talk. Um, the biggest problems that they have about any of the taxes they're mentioning is that they're vague. They're not actually giving us any numbers. Kiwis don't have um, the information in front of us to be able to make a conscious decision. Um, you know, how much are they going to charge us? What are the percentages? What's it going to look like on the books? We're and, not given anything. And there's also, they've also, uh, Labor's also announced a tax working group for after the election, which who knows what they'll come up with. Now, they've recently said that uh, we won't implement any recommendations that come from the review until mm -hmm. after the next election, but... Uh, what's your impression of what's what's likely to be the outcome of uh, that tax review? Well, it baffles. Well, it was. It's a common thing with Labor. Um, more tax is more tax. They just they they need to fund their social policy somehow. Um, the question when they first started raising up the idea of the tax working group, the first question that came to my mind is, hang on, I'm voting for you into Parliament because I understand you should be able to control your economics. You should, you're the people who I'm voting to to make tax policies. So why are you needing a second committee for this? Don't, doesn't, aren't your party, um, isn't your party strong enough or don't they understand economics themselves? Um, National doesn't seem to need it, so what are you? 
It's always I find when they they announce these things, it's to it's to give like they they know that they want to introduce new taxes, but they need to have it have some sort of authority to it. So they say, well, it came from this you know uh, tax recommendation, so it's you know shared by all the experts. Uh, uh, left wing parties they love it you know well the experts you know recommended this so it, so we've got to do it so it's it's designed to make the you know tax more more acceptable because I think contrary to you know how how Jacinda is introducing taxes left right and center that the the left do know that you know tax is too much tax is still unacceptable to the electorate. Well, I mean, if you look at countries like Canada uh, where they've got extremely high taxes in comparison to ours. Um, it gradually will become that way under a Labour government. We'll just see higher and higher taxes and uh, more taxes to help the social policies of the people they choose to help, never mind the rest of us. Um, I, I just think that um, I, I still don't believe... Like, uh, National seems to be very strong on economics. Um, they've always come up with their tax policies or, or the reasoning behind their tax policies seems sound. A lot of people... Um, from ANZ, um, ASB banks, the uh, uh, economic um, editors um, come out supporting them eventually. Okay, yeah, the working groups. I mean, I don't know too much about it, but I just, I think it's dumb. <laughs> I just, I think it's unnecessary is the main point. Like, why do you need it? And um, why, who are these professionals? What are their credentials? What gives them the authority to make the decisions on behalf of New Zealanders, and moreover, um, why why is it that like why is it Labour Party gets to decide um, this specific working group? Um, I just think it's incompetent. It just comes across as incompetent. Um, they should have an economic minister that knows what he's doing. Grant Robinson doesn't give me that appeal. Okay, so we know that Labor they they they're liking to announce you know new taxes and their 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 tax working group, but um, obviously they're collecting all this tax because they want to spend it. What yeah. are what are they planning to spend it on? Labor has always tried to support the young children, the environment, the poor, specifically Maori and Pacific groups. Um, they're very much, they love their groups, um, pretty much. They don't, they don't like to favor everyone. They just like to focus on the 10%, the bottom 10 to 20% of incomes. Um, people that are in docile zero to three schools, uh, one to three schools. Because I've noticed that just, you know, she talks uh, a lot about, you know, child poverty and that's become a, it was a major focus of the, the most recent debate. Is, mm. is that an actual problem in New Zealand, child poverty, or is it just a, a term, a, an emotive you know, term that Jacinta's latched upon because she knows that you know it, it will you know tug at the heartstrings of New Zealanders. And oh yeah, we don't like to hear that children are having it rough. I mean, it goes to the heartstrings, and that's all. That's the only reason why she's doing it. It's changing the conversation from poor families or poor people, because the right wing groups, um, traditionally national voters, they don't like to they don't like to hear about poor people. In Queen Street, we've got a growing number of homeless people, and contrary to what the left wants people just walk past we're sick of it we're tired of it we want them the final solution pick them up and move on um labor has um they've changed the conversation it's pretty much what it's come down to moving from poor people which gains less sympathy to poor children at the end of the day the children who are poor um are there because of bad choices from their parents well it sounds like if Jacinda is successful in Australia. Maybe Bill Shorten will latch onto the idea of uh, mentioning child poverty. Well, it's a hot topic. Um, it has been shared a lot on social media as well. Um, whenever she talks about it, she does get a lot of attention. So it's working, um, but is it working enough? I only time will tell. Labor's been very inconsistent. Um, I think the Nationals' approach is a lot more pragmatic. Um, they want to just empower the youth and empower the um, the young by giving them the skills and the, and the tools and while they're at school. And I think that's the most equitable method. Um, spend the money at the schools, not on the parents, because they're just going to do bad decisions anyway. Uh, we certainly hope that, and it seems with the, the recent polls, which have national back in head, that 
the uh, f- uh, Jacinta mania, as it's called, or uh, the term that I I come up. Uh, come up with a Oh, there's also a Jacinta Madness, that's mm. what I call it as well. It seems that, and Bill English actually said this himself, the stardust has settled and it seems that yeah, people are starting to take a second look. Well, it's because now we have the opportunity. Um, there's a few more people coming forth and being more critical of Jacinda. Um, she's made some mistakes. She's gone back on her word, um, like her tax policy about capital gains tax. She, at first she said, um, we're going to introduce capital gains and then she went um, and said, oh, well, uh, we were only going to do that um, at 2020 if it, if it builds a mandate. And now she's coming back to, um, then she went and said, oh, we're not going to do it anymore. And Rump Robertson said, actually, we are. And then that was against what Jacinda, uh, Jacinda said. Um, and now she's gone back to plan B where, it's, where she's saying, oh, well, you know, we're, we're only going to bring it on 2020 if it becomes a mandate. Um, so she, she, there's a lot of back and forth from her. She's inconsistent and people are starting to see that. So obviously we've discussed the the problems and flaws with uh, Jacinta and Labor with their tax and spend mantra. Now let's turn to uh, the incumbent, uh, Bill English. Now he's he seems to be campaigning on more of the same. And even though it's obvious to people like us that National, uh, the party best man. Uh, Best to manage the the economy and mm. to continue uh, steady steady economic growth. But uh, Bill English, he doesn't really uh, present well to to the electorate. It's sort of you know oh, it's uh, voters and I've, I've seen this in Australia. Voters think well, you've done an all, all right job, but you know you're not giving me enough reason to to keep voting for you. Yeah, Jacinda wins on her personality. She's definitely a much better presenter. Bill English, on the other hand. Um, his policy comes across as a drill sergeant or or a police chief. Um, he he hasn't got that flair. Smiling doesn't come naturally to him. Um, what National has sort of decided, um, as as I've seen their brand, has always been reassurance. That's that they're just consistent on that point. Um, they they just want to reassure people that they're doing the right thing. Um, you don't have to worry. That's that's what Bill English does well when he when he's in his speeches. Um, he doesn't like he's he's he hasn't got the flair like john key so but he's interesting to watch um you can really tell he's kiwi with his accent as well just putting out there um so yeah bill english comes across as a bit rigid um he hasn't got the friendly um the friendly persuasive personality that jacinda has um he comes across a little cold and and while he appeals to the men he's polling badly with the woman um, they like to see a bit more personality um, John Key would have a beer and have a laugh um, you just don't see that in Bill he's very serious and and so there's there's that sort of disconnect that we're getting from him and as a, a lot of the national campaign is obviously don't risk labor which is uh, which is a good focus uh, uh, but it's it's also one where you know, you're saying the the other side's worse. You're not talking about how good you are. Yeah. So, a lot of people have the opinion that National carried them through, um, and the, and the, um, Bill English has also repeated this message across his campaigns as well, where he said, "Well, our party has has steered us through, um, you know, the Christchurch earthquake, the 2008 financial crisis. Um, he steered us through. Um, he's steered us through. He knows what he's doing." He keeps repeating himself that he's the finance minister, so he oversaw all the books, so he knows what he's doing, and that's what people like to hear, and that's what's winning for him so far. Um, he's now brought the books into surplus, and now he's thinking, well, he's made the message clear that now he's got the books into surplus, now we can spend on social, whereas a lot of people are saying, well, in nine years, X, Y, Z hasn't been achieved, and most of the things people come up with are social policies. Oh, there's so much homeless, or there's so many poor children, or or the environment, or, or the working class. Um, that's what the left's major arguments against Bill English is. Um, the problem I have with that, obviously, is, is, well, he's had other shit to do. He's had other things to concentrate on. Um, in nine years, they've accomplished a lot, including um, in improving Auckland City, for instance. Our uh, transport system has been heavily invested. We've just put down a $2.6 billion rail link. Um, that set the books back. Uh, but yeah, he, he needs to talk more about himself. I think his wife Mary has been sending out emails and getting live on Twitter 
to sort of add that sort of personal value. He does resonate really well with families um, compared to the younger individuals. Um, he he's he's a definitely a conservative Christian, which some people are finding a bit difficult to digest because um, New Zealanders, most New Zealanders are centre left. Um, they tend to be centre left on the spectrum of things. They they tend to be quite um, individualist themselves, or libertarian. But the conservatives really love him. Um, he's picking up a lot of thread with them. Uh, it's I, I noticed you mentioned uh, his wife started to get involved when uh, Tony Abbott were, was opposition leader, and they were trying to soften his image with women. They they get his uh, wife uh, Margie out, which is but. Uh, you know, Abbott, he won the 2013 election, you know, in the end. So I, I think that sort of stuff, you know, not being seen as seen, seen as distant and sort of tough. I, 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 I think those sort of criticisms are not all that they're cracked up to be. But let's uh, talk, uh, talk about some, some policy specifics. Now, National are proposing some tax cuts. Yeah, so if you vote for National, they're proposing that the average person will get a, just over a thousand, I think it's a thousand ninety dollar tax cut over the course of your average wage. Um, the medium wage, they're yeah, seventy five thousand or it's probably gone up by now, but um, they're proposing yeah, about you'll save about a thousand bucks. So a lot of their marketing at the moment is saying, Well, if you vote Labour, they're gonna cost you a thousand dollars. And also they're proposing some modest spending measures. For example, there's more money for health GP visits. Yeah, about 600,000 um, 600, low-income families or individuals can go to the GP under the new... Um, well, that's one of the election campaigns. Um, currently in New Zealand, going to the doctor is not all that expensive. It's about 50 bucks. And you've got ability to go to any hospital for free. Um, so we have state funding. Um, so, but it's it's more about the the people outside of the main centres, the ones that are you know too far from a traditional hospital. I mean, we've only got I think three or four in Auckland alone, um, servicing just over one and a half million people. So there's not a lot. Um, but if you go to the doctor with your community services card, um, then yeah, you might be able to get a discount. We ha we don't know yet how much that will be. Um, a lot of doctors, uh, if you register with them as your preferred. Um, clinic, then you get half price off or something like that. A lot of doctors are doing their own methods to become more marketable, but $50 is pretty much the average price. I don't know what Nationals um, thing will change, but who's to know? And also, it's the, this election, it, it reminds me as an Australian of the I'm not sure how familiar you are with Australian politics, but the, the Kevin 07 election, when mm -hmm. Kevin Rudd defeated John Howard, it was, well, we think John Howard's, you know, uh, done, a, done a good job and like, the budget's in surplus and, like, so, you know, we can uh, change to, you know, Labour, they've got a, you know, positive agenda for the future, they can definitely be trusted. And, of course, what happened is Labour blew everything, the surplus, we're still dealing with the, the debt, and that seems to be what this election is... It is about as um, you know. As some people, some voters are feeling, oh well, we've done well. You know, with national, they've got us back to surplus. You know, we can we can trust Labor and we can tr trust Jacinda at a word that you know she's not going to you know blow blow everything. But of course, uh, history will show that. Well, New Zealand Labor Party has always had a history of large um, expenditure um, pre-08. That's why New Zealand's one of the few countries out there that went from the left to the right in a single election without having a major civil war. Um, we, like Labor put us, in, back in the days, in, our, in my grandparents' days, um, back when we had a preferential trade agreement with the UK, um, since 08 we've abolished that. Now thanks to Brexit, we're starting to have talks to re-establish that preferential trade agreement. Um, but yeah, the, the Labour Party has always been big on spending for social causes. What's good for the 10%, but screw over the 90%. It's always kind of been their way. Um, what feels good versus what does good. Whereas National has always been about, let's just do this carefully. Let's, let's not take too much risk. Um, they're not big on social policies. Labor's never had a good track record of spending money. Um, they've always spent large. And um, we got into a massive deficit through our Labor government, and it's only been national, even through the financial crisis. And yes, there's always been, there's been economic growth across the world since 08, but um, national's always been very careful with their spending. And everything they do is, seems to be, in the last four years, has been very transparent. 
Um, so that's why I think now even the polls are showing um, people are mostly supporting National over Labour because now we, we, they have a track record. We can trust what, that they know what they're doing. We may not agree with every decision, but at least we can um, agree that mostly what they do is good um, for the New Zealand, not just for a small percentage of New Zealand. Um, Labour has, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's pretty much all I can really say on the topic. It's not. Yeah. Oh, well, it's my message to New Zealanders is learn from Australia. You know, don't turf out a, you know, all right government and, you know, think the government can be <laughs> trusted to, you know, be responsible because history just shows that's not true. Now, a distinguishing feature of New Zealand's electoral system is that they have dedicated uh, Maori seats, uh, which uh, only uh, proven uh, Maori pe uh, people of descent are, are allowed to, to vote in. Um, now, it's it's quite contentious in uh, in New Zealand. There is a movement to uh, abolish them. For example, New Zealand First, the populist uh, party, they've got a policy to um, abolish uh, Maori seats, but they've been in existence since the New Zealand Parliament was first formed in 1867. Yeah. So uh, there certainly is a momentum that you know, these type of seats are outdated. Yeah, um, like Winston Peters from New Zealand First is an interesting character. He's, he's half Māori himself, but every time anyone points that part of him out, um, he moves away from the identitarian politics and, and he's really is kind of like the Donald Trump in New Zealand um, and he's starting to grow a lot of popularity so he's I mean in this election he will be deciding um, you know will it be a national New Zealand first or will it be a Labour New Zealand first so the, the cards are on the table um, but yeah the, there is a large um, audience of people who just turn around and say I'm so tired of race baiting I'm so tired of 13% of the population um, getting like physical money from the government, these trusts across New Zealand um, get millions of dollars for just being Māori. I'm Māori myself. In fact, the only way I can get onto one of those Māori parliament seats is because if I actually physically, um, during the election process, we have a special vote, and that's specifically for the Māori role. Now, I have to self-identify as Māori on the electoral roll. Doesn't matter what my lineage is, doesn't matter what I put on, the, um, you know, put on any other legal document, Euro European Māori, I have to, in the election, um, say that I'm a Māori and vote under the Māori role. Um, the parties that are offered to me, I, I do get ability to vote for any party, but the electorates are only within maybe three or four parties, and they're very left. And um, I have no option to vote for any other party or any other electorate that is not Māori or comes from the Māori group. Um, there's reasons for that, and it's uh, it, from, it comes from the Treaty of Waitangi, but it also comes from, um, in the past, New Zealanders, we had, um, uh, we had a history where we would restrict Māori being taught in schools. Um, we, it was a racist history. We've all got them. Um, but, uh, but what's happened, I think it was since 1975, I think, just before women got the vote, um, we dedicated, by law, four seats in Parliament. Uh, but yeah, like I said, if I get into these seats, um, these are four seats in Parliament that are, if you get elected on a Māori only role. So um, yeah, people like me who are on the special vote, only the pool, the pool is much smaller to get onto those seats. 13% um, of the population are Māori, self-identifying. Um, only about 3% of New Zealanders actually speak Te Rau Māori. Um, to give you that context, if we're talking about like the largest group obviously is European um, but the second uh, the second biggest language apart from English being spoken in New Zealand Samoan then it goes down somewhere um, I think it might have changed since 2013 uh, because we've got a lot more immigration recently anyway but I'd say Chinese is up there certainly a lot more Chinese speakers than Maori speakers in New Zealand yet for some reason New Zealand has this um, there's a big pushback from Maori groups to uh, to push te rā Māori or mandatory in schools and a lot of people are saying no make Māori an option in school but don't make it mandatory um, there's the, the left believe that um, you know if everyone was taught Māori we would respect the culture more we'd speak the language more the fact of the matter is 99% of people speak English um, and all the Māori can speak English they all speak English so the idea of jamming down 
language that only 3% speak is rubbish. It's trying to make up for the past and just let the language die. Yeah, I noticed that, and Australians who visited New Zealand uh, over the years will notice that there, there's heaps of things they have there, the English name and then the, the Maori, 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 Maori name. name. And yeah, most of us don't know why. Um, it's Well, we know why, but we just don't see the purpose. It doesn't seem necessary. It seems like they're forcing it down our throats, but people have this belief that Maori culture is New Zealand culture, but that's not correct. Um, most Kiwis do not identify as Maori any which way. Um, we don't we don't think about Maori. We don't think about the culture. We're not a part of it. And even if it was more around us, we still wouldn't be. Um, I would probably identify closer with Chinese culture than I would with Maori culture. Yet I grew up in, um, I've you know I grew up in um, uh, up north. Um, my family are from Rawani, which is um, uh, for those of your viewers who don't know, it's the place where Honi Hickey chopped down the flagpole. Um, a moment in New Zealand history. Um, Napui, biggest tribe, Ngāti Pado, also quite big. But, I mean, unless my parents told me about that, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care to search it up myself to find out where I'm from, or if I was coming from a Māori group, I wouldn't care. Um, we have in, um, a lot of universities that have marais on campus. They try and teach it in the schools. Um, New Zealand has always had this sort of favoritism or, or empathy for Pacific Island groups. Um, Māori make up half the prison population. Um, the rest is mostly Samoan, Tongan, um, Pacific Island groups. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of people have negative things to say about Chinese, for instance, but they make up less than 1%. I mean, you know, they're not committing crimes. Um, yeah, Māori people make up the largest crime statistics, appalling crime statistics. Um, health problems, they take more than they give, basically. Um, the police recently in New Zealand has... Uh, recently changed one of their police cars to have, uh, I think it's party marama or something, it doesn't, you know, Maori language on the side of the police car. Overwhelming amount of Kiwis on that Herald Post that I saw were just outright against it. They're just like, what's the point? My money is going to pay for this? Why? What's the point? Um, and it also is like, what's the point for news, like the internationals? If I see a car whizzing past me with a language I'm not familiar with, but I know what police looks like in English because I've learnt it in school. If I was, you know, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, whoever else, you know, police is a word that people know. Is there still this sense of uh, white guilt pushed on oh, like white yeah. white New Zealanders that there's still like even though like and everyone admits like wrongs were done in the past, yep. but you know the great thing about you know countries like uh, New Zealand and Australia is that we overcame them. But it seems we learned that them, yeah. the the left can you know never. And never concede that uh, you know we've we've overcome them. And oh. Our society is still you know horrible, horrible and racist. And there's you know conspiracy to you know keep you know or in New Zealand Maori people you know poor and oh, locked that, up. Oh, that view is definitely held by the far left, the Mana Party, the Aotearoa New Zealand Party, and the Maori um, and the Maori Party. They definitely have this view. Um, recently in Auckland, we had a statue, and this is a second statue we've had. Um, there's calls for the statue to be taken down because this was an oppressive person from the Māori times, from the, uh, the Battle of Great Pa and all that kind of thing, um, battle across the nations, and it was because he was very oppressive against Māori. The thing is, uh, this, this strange, like, the strange perverted movement to, um, to make amends for the past is stupid. People of today were not oppressed. We don't, we don't remember any of those people you're talking about, and it's only those people who are obsessed with the Māori history that are apologetics. Um, general day-to-day -day Kiwis, um, we're just like, okay, you know, in the past we had war, we signed a document, we made, we made amends, we agreed to everything, we gave everyone equal rights, and we thought, okay, we were going to work together. And eventually, more people came, and eventually the populations of all um, groups, except for the Māori grew. And I think what's happening now is that realism where they're saying, well, we're kind of being bred out of existence. And our language is, there's, with the left, it's never enough. Nothing is ever enough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, you know, they recently had um, Mount Eden over in Auckland. They had, they must have it changed to a Māori name. Or we're getting a lot of the street, um, street signs being changed to Māori names. There's a recent one which, um, I'm not sure if I can say the N-word on your radio station, 
yeah. No, so. <laughs> probably not. Well, we had okay, Nigger Hill. It was mm. called Nigger Hill. And we recently got it changed um, to um, a, a particular Māori name for grass so that actually grows in the area. Now, that that kind of stuff is okay for me. I, I, don't, I don't mind it um, because it's like... It's a grass that's native to New Zealand. It happens to have a Maori name, but it, then again, it also so has an English name. So there's a sort of controversy. Um, we're having a lot of um, English names being replaced with Maori names, just because the Maori groups are the loudest, they're the most emotional, and I'm sure it's a, like that with many places in the world. Ah, oh, yeah, Australia. There's uh, in recent months there's a move to tear down our colonial. Uh, statues, you know, rename places, give them you know, indigenous names. So yeah, Australia and New Zealand is exactly the same in that regard. Though there is uh, you know, a lot of the left in Australia, they look at you know Maori seats in New Zealand, and they think that's a great idea to Im- import here. And recently, a group of Aboriginal activists they they got together and. Um, it was, it's called the Uluru Declaration from from the heart, where they haven't exactly called for Aboriginal seats, but they want uh, a, a special uh, Indigenous voice to Parliament, which is some sort of advisory council, which How we have dumb. no idea would actually operate. But it actually sounds worse than Mary seats because it sounds like it wouldn't actually be democratic at all. It'd just be a bunch of self-appointed, you know, elders. Yeah. I mean, like for all intents and purposes, our Maori seats. You have a special pool of people, but it comes from um, our, our treaty obligations. So we have a legal obligation with the Crown. Um, we got a, a joint agreement. Yes, at least it's partially democratic. At least those people who self-identify as Māori can vote for the person of their choice to go into it. The only thing is that that person being elected is only there as token. It's tokenism. They are there for Māori rights or Māori issues. Um, there's arguments like the natural resources. Um, there's arguments about, um, well, various tribal property rights that occur. Um, there's land. We recently had the land and foreshore seabed issue. Um, I think four or five years ago, where, where National just came out and said, "Right, we're not going to do this. We're going to make it for everyone." And then neither the crown nor Maori own it, which was the right move. Um, but yeah, it, it's if you guys are doing um, affirmative action based on race, then that's just racist. Um, that is appalling, absolutely appalling. And New Zealanders resent having Māori seats. There's a huge, I mean, the left can push as hard as they want with Māori and jam it down our throats. But what's happening is what has I've seen over the last 10 years. There's just a growing, insidious level of resentment. People just, it's even, it's like they're creating the devil that they, they're against. They're creating racists. They're creating people who just do not like Māori now. And... They don't want anything to do with Māori culture or customs or language. Most New Zealanders can't read Māori. Um, I grew up in a Māori environment, so I, I do know. But most people, when they say, like, Whangarei, instead, um, Europeans and most internationals will say Wangarei. Instead of Taupo, it'll be Taupo. Because people just don't know the pronunciation of names. Now, if I was to say anything um, for, like the language protection of Māori language and like anything, and I think a lot of liberals or libertarians may or may not agree, I don't know. Um, you make conscious effort to learn pronunciation of a language. Um, when I get taught a language or, or a specific word in that language, I, I do my best just to be kind. But um, like, so teaching phonics in school, um, but I think that's the most you can ask is to teach phonics, to teach basic pronunciation. If the children choose to learn on their own merits, then fine, be all, you know, all the hats off to them but um, at the moment we've got is um, Māori being trying to force down the schools uh, they're trying to force it into the schools never mind any other languages that are popular um, never mind what the parents want no no it's just it's just what the specific racial group wants now probably the biggest issue in in this campaign is housing affordability now uh, this is uh, talked about in Australia as well in our major cities uh, S- uh, Sydney and Melbourne, but when I heard uh, in, the, in the recent debate that in Auckland the average ha- house price is uh, one million dollars, I was like, "What? <laughs> like that, that? That's insane! Like, how has it been able to get to such a ridiculous mm. level?" Well, yeah, um, probably about ten, fifteen years ago, when I was younger, the average price of the house was about three hundred to four hundred dollars, uh, thousand dollars. Um, now, yeah, it's basically over a million. Now, there's a lot of arguments to that. There's um, people are saying it's immigration. 
Um, people are saying it's um, you know Kiwis coming back home and buying up houses. Um, my position is my parents' generation that really screwed it for my generation. Um, my parents' generation would often buy a house and then sell it, like renovate it, sell it quickly, and it was it was huge. This was the age of carpenters. Um, but I mean, back when I was in high school, I looked at what was going on around me. Um, and I realized that from an early time, uh, I don't want to buy a house. I won't be able to afford it. Everyone's buying up these houses and selling them on. It sounds nice, and, and property the property industry was um, really strong in New Zealand, a really good uh, industry to get into. Um, I know a couple of real estate agents who made over a million a year just in four years alone. Um, so it was a really competitive industry. It's starting to slow down now. Um, the bubble sort of popped a bit. Um, but yeah, uh, people, a lot of my um, some of my colleagues and my classmates they've um, they've told me they don't want to buy a house either. It's out of their depth. Um, they're quite comfortable to pay rent between four hundred to five hundred dollars a week as long as their um, their wages cover that and they can live and save three hundred bucks a week. They can live comfortably um, because that's all that people really want. They just want to live comfortably. Um, I mean, yes, you can just buy to wealth, but you know, just just to get by the day to day. Um, People are pushing a lot more to, like I think ACT Party recently challenged West Auckland. West Auckland, and, and this comes back to Māori politics in New Zealand. Um, in West Auckland, um, there is a Māori trust and they own the rights to that land. So um, for instance, alcohol stores. All across Auckland, you can have alcohol stores and bottle stores anywhere. Um, but in West Auckland, you can't. And th there's only two shops that sell alcohol um, the supermarket isn't allowed beer or wine, and I, I, it's an old argument, but it sounds like they're trying to say that Māori can't control their drinking, because in the past that was the case. Um, in the past, back in the, the 40s, 50s, there was a lot of Māori in prison because they couldn't handle their alcohol. Um, but yeah, so I think that might have been why the law had um, come down hard on that area. They just want to avoid the temptation. Um, but yeah, so West Auckland, if you want to open a bottle store, you have to get regulatory pr approval through the Māori Council. And you also have to pay a tax because you know they need their money. <laughs> There's an old joke in New Zealand: um, the Maori queen was buried six feet down so she could still get a handout. <laughs> but um, anyways, I digress. Um, yeah, so Act Party I think is wanting to open up that land um, to take away this this tribunal. Um, there's no reason for a lot of the a lot of the land that they're wanting to um, use for housing and just open up the supply a bit is basic farming land it's not precious there's no moldy burial sites there's no farming sites of traditional past there's nothing uniquely special about the land historically or otherwise and which is often the case um, that slows down production of anything uh, recently we had a, a batch at Murawai that they weren't allowed to construct anything simply because there was a moldy burial remains found never mind that people didn't know who they were from they were so badly decayed no one actually could claim them but because it was moldy it was that was it. Um, uh, personally, I think uh, to destroy the housing crisis, I think most uh, Generation Y and Zs, we don't really care for a four bedroom house. We don't want to start a family and have children. Marital rates have declined since the 80s and they're quite low today. Um, most people are not religious. We don't have that sort of desire to have a traditional family household. Um, the, I mean, I can't really speak for everyone, but that's just what the stats show. Um, there's uh, so I mean I'm seeing a lot of individualism um, growing so people are having their own flats they're having two bedroom apartments in fact just last year the purchase of two bedroom apartments has, has increased since the previous year by like 26% um, so two bedroom apartments and that simply is because like Kiwis like me would, would rent out the entire apartment become head tenants and sublet the next room and this is what a lot of Kiwis are doing now, um, where housing is not really that unaffordable. Um, I've got, you know, I can get a flatmate, I can pay the rest of it. It's not that bad. I can save up 600 bucks a week if I'm earning a decent wage, if I'm earning over a grand comfortably. Um, people are moving, yeah, they're just moving to the flatting lifestyle. There's a lot of call on build up, not out. So one of the biggest um, opinions that are out there at the moment is we don't want to keep taking up land. We just want to build up. Put centralized because Auckland um, has been built around our harbors so there's 
um, there's a lot of um, like the average uni student travels to uni for between 30 minutes an hour and for most people that's too much by the time you suss out food and, and dinner and, and try and work out the admins of your day um, so a lot of people want more intensive building they don't want to spread out they don't want to travel three hours to get to the city New Zealand doesn't also have a very good motorway system um, since the 60s when cars were sort of really pushing through um, New Zealand doesn't have good motorways like in say in Melbourne um, we have very tight motorways and, and it, all the buildings are close to the street so it's hard to actually expand you have to knock down properties to actually build a motorway properly um, but yeah the uh, the um, uh, so yeah most most people in the younger generation just want to just want to have an apartment oh well that's still uh, I mean for me housing affordability includes apartment affordability I mean you need to make sure that uh, the supply is increasing yeah. in in some place and yeah, building up is is part of that and definitely if they you know built more apartments that would that would also decrease the the pressure on on house prices in the suburbs I mean the thing is is that what the left don't understand is that if they want to ban immigrants and that's going to um, cripple our labor economy because a lot of we rely on a lot of immigrants for a lot of the gaps in the marketplace um, the thing is, is that we will always have a population growth and when immigrants for instance come to New Zealand um, they come to Auckland more than 50% of New Zealand is in the upper North Island uh, we New Auckland itself makes up for I think about 30% roughly about 30% of the entire country's population um, and the simple truth of that is because it's central it's near beaches it's widespread it's nice um, so with more people coming here I mean you've got two options you can either build out you can decentralize this, this the city which is what's becoming more of a popular um, decision among the council they want to build up in North Shore for instance in Takapuna um, or you can just build up and building up is the way to go for most people yeah oh well, it's, it's certainly I uh, with the I know that uh, immigration uh, has become an issue in the campaign and uh, Bill English he's he said that you know we need the, you know these immigrants mm. to you know uh, f fill these jobs it, se it seems to me that you know obviously you need to have a sustainable you know immigration level but for me housing it always comes down to making sure that there's enough supply and mm. that seems to be that the the policy that no one seems to want to address uh, it's a complicated issue because it's the dichotomy of do you um People who are have their critiques about the housing supply, I've, I've seen just the same sort of opinion come through, and it's that we must um, we must mandate or regulate the housing industry. Uh, we must put in policies or we must restrict somehow to reduce the supply. The other side of that is also we just need to build. We just need to we just need to invest in building infrastructure. Um, I think personally, increasing supply is the way to go forward. Um, I I just don't see any other method. That's that's going to build. Um, that's going to you know add to New Zealand. Well, Mark, I've uh, appreciated you, uh, yeah, coming to, to meet me to be here on the show. It's great to meet uh, the people from from Right Minds uh, in person, and also <laughs> to um, to gain a, a better insight into uh, uh, not just uh, the election issues, but New Zealand politics in general. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I am in New Zealand until the 25th of September, and I can now confirm that we will do, be doing an election night live stream with our affiliate Right Minds New Zealand. So I hope that you can tune in for that and also stay tuned for the rest of our New Zealand content. The Unshackled will still be covering what is happening in Australia. Uh, thank you for, to the rest of the Unshackled team for holding the, the fort back home. And of course, don't forget the Unshackled is sponsoring the first ever Liberty Works in Brisbane on Saturday the 14th of October 2017, hosted by our friends at Liberty Works. You can get a 20% discount on tickets by visiting libertyfest.org.au using the coupon code LFUNSHACK, all caps. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net. 
and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.